Hi, I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire, and welcome to another season on This Week in Pro Football. And each week throughout the season, we'll be bringing you filmed highlights of all the action of the previous week. And as we head into a new year, Tom, this looks like it's going to be another great year. Well, the excitement, of course, caused by the new alignment and the new rookies like Bradshaw with the Steelers and Castor with the Jets and old stars like John Unitas with Baltimore. It looks like a great year for pro football. As I'm sure you can remember, this time of year is sort of a second lease on life because you're through living with the same guys in training camp every week. Uh, you've got your wives and your families back with you. Uh, you're back in the city that you play for, really, and out of training camp. And it is like almost taking a second win. Well, Pat, as tough as the preseason games are, and they're all out, there's no doubt about it, there's nothing like the regular season football games in professional football. So maybe the little lady wants to buy a new refrigerator or a coat, so you better play hard. For our first show, we'll look back at some of last year's most spectacular action, and first we'll look at the 16 teams of last year's NFL. And we'll be right back to do that after this message. Pro football possesses all the elements of show business. And the 1969 NFL season unfolded as if following a Hollywood script. Like Broadway and Hollywood, pro football has its own matinee idols, supporting actors and bit players. Men who put their talent on display each Sunday afternoon. Like aspiring actors, hundreds of skilled athletes take the field each year, hoping to win the fame and fortune accorded a pro football star. But only a few can succeed. These are the exciters the stars of the NFL. The excitement begins with the kickoff, and that means Travis Williams of the Green Bay Packers. He's called the Roadrunner, and his special talent is flat-out speed that allows him to crack open a game at any moment. The San Francisco 49ers displayed a youthful vitality in 1969, and much of the excitement was provided by rookies like number 24, Jimmy Thomas. The Philadelphia Eagles haven't had much to cheer about in recent years, but newcomer Harold Jackson, number 29, led the NFL in receiving yardage and combined with Ben Hawkins, number 18, to give the Eagles two long-distance threats and new hope for the future. In 1969, the Detroit Lions raced to a surprising second-place finish in the Central Division. Number 45, Bobby Williams, typified the Lions' spirit. Filling in for injured players, Williams led the NFL in kickoff returns and combined with veterans like Lem Barney, number 20, to bring new thrills to Detroit. Dan Abramowitz, number 46, and Roy Jefferson, number 87, are two of the most exciting receivers in the NFL. Abramowitz has the ability to discover slivers of daylight in defenses and did it often enough to lead the NFL in receiving. While Abramowitz specialized in the short pass, Pittsburgh's Roy Jefferson, number 87, specialized in the long gainer. With the powerful stride of a thoroughbred and a pair of sure hands, Roy Jefferson became one of the most graceful and consistent deep threats in the game. Due to a recent trade, Jefferson's long gainers this season will be part of the Baltimore Colts attack. In St. Louis, the big surprise was number 44, John Gilliam, who provided a bright ray of hope in an otherwise dark year for the Cardinals. Gilliam averaged over 20 yards per catch. 
and against Green Bay, rocketed 100 yards for the kickoff. In 1969, Gilliam gave notice that he could become one of the most spectacular players in the NFL. But the most spectacular of all is Gail Sayers. Although the Bears stumbled through their worst season in history, Sayers once again led the NFL in rushing. A crippling knee injury threatened his career, but Sayers staged a remarkable comeback to regain his crown as king of pro football's runners. While Sayers has been a star for several years, a group of young runners made their debut in 1969, leading defenders on a wild chase. The NFL audience was introduced to a group of overnight successes. Calvin Hill of the Dallas Cowboys. Dave Hampton of the Green Bay Packers. Harmon Wages of the Atlanta Falcons. And Larry Brown of the Washington Redskins. Most rookies expect to spend their first year on the sideline, but the Cowboys' Calvin Hill burst into the limelight right away. From Yale University, Hill was named Rookie of the Year and became the most feared power-speed combination since Jimmy Brown. His hurdling running style became an NFL trademark. Although in his second year, Atlanta's Harmon Wages, number five, came into his own in 1969, proving that the sophomore jinx is only a hoax. Wages resembles his boyhood idol, Paul Horning, in number and in running style and is one of the many youthful reasons the South may rise again in Atlanta. The new runners came in all shapes and sizes, from 6'4", 230-pound Calvin Hill to 5'10", 180-pound Larry Brown of Washington. Brown, number 43, is a jackrabbit quick running back who injected new excitement into the Redskins' offense. He's fast and shifty, but the trait that allows Brown to play in a big man's game is complete disregard for danger. The tough guys, the villains. Like Hollywood, pro football too has its heavies and they sound like movie characters. The Deacon. The Rabbit. Bubba and the sheriff. But Chicago's Dick Butkus bears no nickname because there is no word violent enough to describe him. Bring him in here! Jimmy Butkus! Kill him! Rip his head off! Stick him, Butkus! In pro football, coaches direct the show. 
Upon their shoulders rests the burden of victory and defeat. And in football, as in show business, when the show goes bad, the directors change. In 1969, four new coaches entered the NFL. Chuck Knoll in Pittsburgh. Alex Webster in New York. Jerry Williams in Philadelphia. And in Washington, the most successful new coach of 1969, Vince Lombardi. For 14 years, the Redskins had been losers. So they recruited the dynasty builder from Green Bay. Critics doubted Lombardi's promise to build a winner the first year because he had inherited a team of nameless faces and a quarterback known as much for his free spirit as for his whiplash throwing on. After enduring some frustrating moments, the Lombardi discipline began to take effect. Sonny Jergensen and Charlie Taylor became one of the most prolific combinations in the league. Jurgensen had always been an artistic passer, but seldom a winner. Under the Lombardi system, he was the league's leading passer. Vince Lombardi brought the victory smile back to Sonny Jurgensen, as the Redskins enjoyed their first winning season since 1955. The quarterback is at the center of the drama. Around him, the plot unfolds. The quarterback is the main character, the actor at center stage, constantly in the spotlight. He lives in a world of pressure, and his success depends on how well he withstands the punishment. The successful ones learn to live with the pressure, to pick up the pieces and start over again. For more than a decade, Baltimore has been the home of one of the most successful, John Unitas. After winning the NFL championship in 1968, and with Unitas recovered from arm trouble, the Colts were once again expected to ravage the league. Instead, they were a mystery team, sometimes flashing brilliance, but never regaining the luster of the once powerful Colts. Once known for his last second battles against the clock, John Unitas, at age 36, found that time was running out. Green Bay also witnessed the fading of an era. For 13 years, Bart Starr had been a clever, calculating leader. But in 1969, Starr fell prey to age and injury, and his pupil, Don Horn, inherited the job. With the retirement of vintage Packer heroes like Willie Davis, Henry Jordan, and Boyd Dowler, any future hope will ride on the talent of youngsters like Horn and number 25, Dave Hampton. Horn showed he has learned his lessons well. And although the pack never made it back in 1969, Horn's five touchdown passes against St. Louis provided ample evidence that they may make it in 1970, as the Packers witnessed the dawn of a new era and the passing of the old. In 1969, the NFL was composed of four divisions. The champion of each division was led by a quarterback who played the leading role in his team's success story. Let's look now at these four quarterbacks and the championship teams they played for. The Minnesota Vikings, the Los Angeles Rams, the Cleveland Browns, and the Dallas Cowboys. Each team in the NFL reflects the character of their quarterback. And the Dallas Cowboys, like Craig Morton, are young, strong, and on the way up. The Cowboys were a team in transition with a mixture of talented youngsters and proud veterans. They were heralded as pro football's next great team.
Morton had played in the shadow of retired Don Meredith. But in 1969, showed he had enough talent of his own to lead the Cowboys to the Capital Division title. The Cleveland Browns also mirror the personality of their leader, Bill Nelson. Nelson is a shrewd, cool performer, relying more on poise and precision than on physical gifts. He didn't have the most powerful arm in the league, but through to the most talented receivers, Milt Morin, Gary Collins, and number 42, Paul Warfield. Warfield strikes with the quickness of a cobra, but his real talent is an uncanny ability to catch the ball under pressure. Due to an off-season trade, Warfield's all-pro moves this year will be made in behalf of Don Shula's Miami Dolphins. The Browns tore up the Century Division with a quick-striking offense and a defiant team attitude that challenged every opponent. In rain-drenched Dallas, the Browns met the Cowboys for the Eastern Conference title. And Dallas knew right away it wasn't their day. Bill Nelson's plan was simple. He drove the Browns downfield with passes over the middle to his talented receivers, and then used his running backs to power over for scores. Craig Morton's soggy throwing arm misfired and Cleveland was quick to turn mistakes into points. Cleveland pounded out a 38 to 14 victory over the Cowboys and won the right to meet the Western Conference winner for the NFL championship. In the Western Conference, the Los Angeles Rams have been known historically as a brutal, hard-hitting team whose reckless play forces opponents into mistakes. The Rams' physical character reflects the style of their leader, Roman Gabriel. At 6'4 and 220, Gabriel was the biggest and strongest quarterback in the league and could withstand any amount of pressure to lead the Rams to victory. Gabriel's rambling style led the Rams to the Coastal Division title, and he received Pro Football's Academy Award as the most valuable player. But from the frozen north came something even tougher. An awesome collection of brawlers who sounded like characters in a western movie. Injun Joe and the Purple Gang. The Minnesota Vikings were a savage band who tore apart their opponents, en route to 12 straight victories, and were led by a gutsy quarterback, Injun Joe Cap. He was a leader not only in word, but in deed. And with guts more than ability, he led the Vikings to the Central Division title. In cold, frozen Minnesota, the Vikings and Rams met to decide the Western Conference Championship. And at first, Roman Gabriel seemed unaffected by the icy chill of the Minnesota winter. Gabriel drove the Rams as he had driven them all season, and his touchdown pass to number 87, Billy Truax, gave them a commanding 17-7 lead. But Joe Cap is toughest with the odds against him. He is a gambler. By air and by land, he led the Vikings in a come-from-behind effort.
While Cap ignited the offense, a stubborn Viking front four ended any title hopes the Rams may have had and carried off the Western Conference title. Once again, the fire and fury of the Vikings had proven supreme, and the 23-20 victory gave Minnesota the chance to meet Cleveland for the NFL championship. The frozen tundra of Metropolitan Stadium was the setting for the 50th NFL championship between the Vikings and the Cleveland Browns. The two teams had met earlier in the season with the Vikings scorching the Browns 51 to three. On this bitterly cold day, the only things that remained warm were Joe Capp's throwing arm and a grudging Viking defense that allowed Cleveland only one touchdown all afternoon. The powerful Viking front four pressured Nelson all day and finally ruined his throwing arm. The Browns were dead, and like a vulture, Joe Cap moved in to picket their remains. The Vikings made their bid for their first NFL championship in dramatic fashion, as Gene Washington's incredible receptions moved the ball downfield. For Minnesota, it was a day when everything seemed to work. In typical Joe Cap style, a broken play became a touchdown. The Vikings made it look like a runaway as they piled up 24 points in the first half. The team that had waited nine years for a championship became the first expansion team ever to win an NFL championship as they trampled the Browns 27 to seven. The only thing that stood between the Vikings and football immortality was a team from that other league. New Orleans, January 11th, 1970, the Super Bowl. As Kansas City's Len Dawson walked the field before the game, he reflected on what he had suffered to get there. He had suffered more injuries than a normal man could endure, but he also felt the pain of a forgotten man. 14 years before, Len Dawson had been a number one draft choice in the NFL, but was rejected because they said he wasn't good enough. Now he was back to haunt them, and this was his revenge. He spoke for all those who had been rejected by the NFL. He spoke for Don Maynard, Ben Davidson, Jack Kemp, and others. But most of all, Lynn Dawson was a fitting symbol for the merger of the two leagues. He represents the determination and courage the AFL showed in its 10-year climb to football equality. And in 1970, that other league will no longer exist as the National Football League will be a union of the greatest stars in the game. The world champion Super Chiefs, and what better way to start a new year than a replay of last year's Super Bowl? I have to ask you, Tom, who you're picking. Well, I think Hank Stram sends the Chiefs into a ball game better prepared than any team in pro football. And I think Lenny Dawson knows what he can and can't do, uh, as well as any quarterback. Uh, I'm going to have to go with the Kansas City Chiefs until someone beats the champion. I think they're a great football team. Minnesota's had a good preseason. Gary Quazos looked particularly good, and the Minnesota defense is always to be reckoned. It's always good, and they're stunning more than ever. And perhaps uh, championships are won with defense rather than with offensive quarterbacks. But this is a classic battle, and of course, neither team will give an inch. And I guess there would be some revenge uh, in, in store here, too. I would think so. Let me just get it straight now. You're picking Kansas City. I'm going with Kansas City. Now, okay. Pat, last year, and I don't want to bring this up, but I must, uh, you picked Dallas to go all the way to the Super you had to bring it up. Huh? <laughs> I still think, Tom, uh, that Dallas has got some of the great talent in this professional game. I think probably if you just go strictly on ability, that Dallas ranks right up with the best of them, Kansas City, Minnesota, whoever you might pick. They're a great football team. I don't know what's missing. 
But again, I think they're going to be good. Uh, what do you feel about uh, the first meeting between Cleveland and the New York Jets? Well, this has to be one of the great rivalries that's going to be building up through the years. Uh, the Browns will go with the NFL-type zone defense, and uh, I think the Colts will bear me out. Uh, Joe Namath can really rip up a zone, so uh, I would say Cleveland has to play one of their better games to beat the Jets. So who are you picking? I'll go with the Cleveland Browns. I'll go with the Jets. I've seen them a couple of times in preseason, and they are a good football team with or without Namath. They've got a lot of talent, too. All right, Pat. At any rate, we'll be back here to show you what happens next week. I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summers.